Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your attention and thank you everyone at Loop for inviting me and for hosting this incredible event. It looks like it's, I just arrived from the airport just a few minutes ago, but it looks like it's going to be pretty great. So uh, this won't be the most fun or entertaining talk that you will observe at Loop. <laughs> But I'm happy to see you here because I think it may prove to be um, useful. I hope that what I'm going to share with you will be information that you can use in your lives and that you can pass on to other people and that maybe they can use in their lives as well. I wish that the information or the research findings that I'm about to share with you, I wish that it was from my own laboratory, I wish it was my own work. It's not. It's the work of other people who are far more experienced than I and have been in many cases working on um, something called auditory neuropathy, which I'm going to share with you. Uh, they've been working on hearing health for many, many decades, so I'm sharing their work with you. And uh, I think it, 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 it I, I hope it'll be good. So as a preface, let me suggest to you, suppose you were working as a lifeguard and you were at the beach every day. And suppose it was in Italy or Spain where the sun is out every day. <laughs> you wouldn't think of going out onto the beach every day without wearing sunscreen you would just kind of know that if you take the sensory organ that is your skin and you overly stimulate it all the time, you're going to get enough sunburn to the point where at some point it may turn into melanoma and you may get skin cancer. Everyone knows this, so everyone wears sunscreen so that we have a barrier of protection uh, keeping us from overly stimulating the sensory organ. And we don't stare at the sun, we learned when the eclipse was happening in the United States not that long ago. Well, most of us learned. Some people didn't. But uh, most people knew you don't stare at the sun because if you overly stimulate the organ of sight, you, you could burn it out. But we don't really think in those terms when we think of our hearing. And for those of you who are in the music business or hoping to make a living in some way that involves using your ears, it stands to reason that you would need to know how to protect your ears. It also stands to reason that if you're experiencing a little bit of uh, hearing loss or perhaps some tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, that you might want to know about treatments that are in the works right now, hoping to alleviate those disorders. So that's what we're going to talk about. We'll start with the good news, we'll get to the bad news, and we'll end with more good news. <laughs> Uh, science has known for the last 15 or 20 years or so that there are two things you can do in childhood that will improve your auditory processing. One is musical training. Kids who have had formal musical training starting at the age, well, starting when they were young, but preferably starting before the age of 14 or so, those young people, because they're practicing with a musical instrument day in and day out, grow up to be kind of auditory, sound processing athletes. Uh, the other thing that can do that for you is learning a second language. I'm sure, I bet most of you in this room speak more than one language, but young people who are having to listen to subtle differences between vowel sounds or subtle differences between, I don't know, drum tones or, or pitches, what happens is in the pathway, the neural pathway that goes from the cochlea right up here to the cortex. It's only about this long, 25, 26 millimeters. But that pathway is full of nuclei that are responsible for processing all the sounds we've ever heard in our lives. Uh, the old saying is, use it or lose it. And another saying that's a better one than that is, anything you do a lot, you get good at. So be careful what you do a lot. <laughs> Um, if you spend a lot of time listening to the fine details of sound, when you're a child, you develop more branches on your auditory nerve bundle, and you develop auditory nuclei that are fatter and thicker. So consequently, when you get older, 
you can show differences that look kind of like this when uh, the researchers will stick the electrodes right here on your scalp and maybe you wear that bathing cap that's got the ERP electrodes, you stick it on there and you measure the participant's response to, let's say, piano tones. And over there on the left, you're seeing the non-pianist's response waveform, and on the right, you're seeing a piano player's. On the top, it's adults, and on the bottom, it's children. This is just one of many, many, many uh, graphs, graphic depictions of how uh, people who had musical training in childhood grow up to become people who can process audio sounds with a, a stronger response. And that work comes from Nina Krause's lab. She's at uh, Northwestern in Chicago. So musicians also show better memory for sounds. Uh, they show better pitch perception. They have a higher capacity to hear sounds in noisy environments. Those with a lot of musical training, even when they get very, very old, much older musicians in their 70s and their 80s, have a better capacity than non-musicians to pick out sounds in a reverberant environment. Or they're not necessarily asking their, uh, their compatriots at the old folks' home to turn up the TV because they can hear it a little bit better. Uh, so this is looking at older adults and young adults and school-aged children and preschoolers. And in the red, it's the musicians, which you see it's a much hotter signal than the non-musicians, which is in the black. Again, that's from Nina Kraus and her work from 2013. Uh, Patrick Wong was one of Nina Krauss's students, and this is a, a figure that I really love showing students at Berkeley where I teach. This is comparing musicians on the left and non-musicians on the right. And what they're comparing is something called the frequency following response. It refers to the brain's ability to track pitch. As you may know, pitch is present in all of our pitched musical instruments, but it's also present in vowel sounds. It's not present in the consonants, B, P, C, but it's there in the vowel sounds. So musicians show a better capacity than non-musicians at extracting and tracking the regularities in a signal that determines what its pitch is. So on the left, what you're seeing is uh, what looks like more or less a straight the middle one, the one that says frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, and it shows a yellow line and a black line. That's pitch tracking from a musician, from the circuits in the brain that uh, are responsible for processing audio. Look how scrambled it is on the right side for the non-musician. It's a big difference. At the bottom are two autocorrelations. Autocorrelations are a mathematical function that tracks regularities over time. So essentially what it's saying is musicians have a much higher capacity than non-musicians to track regularities in sound and to, to uh, process the signal. But all of these advantages will be lost if the organ of hearing if the, if the cochlea is damaged. Uh, damage happens through excessive noise exposure, but it also happens through natural aging. As we get older, we're going to lose some of our hearing. We're going to lose some of our processing capacity because noise is all around us. Just like, go back to the lifeguard example, just like the sun is always there, you don't have to be a lifeguard to get exposure to sun. You're going, it's, it's in your environment. Likewise, you're going to be exposed to noise, but those of us who work in the music business are at greater risk because we're exposed to really high levels of sound. So music industry professionals, many of them can suffer from tinnitus or hyperacusis. Tinnitus is that ringing in your ears. It's not the ringing that happens after you've been in a really noisy club. That that's, it has a slightly different source. Tinnitus, chronic tinnitus especially, is that ringing in your head that can happen usually when you're about to fall asleep when it's really quiet and your nervous system is calmed down, 
sometimes you'll hear that ringing in your head. And for some people, it's really, really aversive. It's, uh, for some people, it's chronically bad. Roughly 47% of musicians report that they experience tinnitus. A recent report that I just read says that uh, young people are starting to experience it more than ever before, probably because they're wearing earbuds and at a really high sound pressure level. Uh, the other phenomenon, different from tinnitus, is hyperacusis, which means heightened sensitivity to sounds in a certain frequency bands. I don't have tinnitus myself, but I know I've got a little bit of hyperacusis. You know you have it if you're standing at a street corner and you're holding stuff in your arms so your hands are not free, and a big truck or a bus stops at that light and they've got air brakes and it gives that really high whee! <laughs> sound, and everybody around you is going, no problem, and you're like, ah, <laughs> that's hyperacusis. Hyperacusis is when you're more sensitive than most people to sounds in certain frequency bands. Um, so just as sunscreen protects skin from too much sun, hearing protection prevents damage from too much stimulation. And if you're experiencing tinnitus or hyperacusis, it's, a, it's an early warning sign that your auditory system has been overly taxed by sound pressure levels. So now let's walk through the hearing system, and I'll, uh, you, many of you will already know all this, but uh, for those of you who don't, it'll, um, it'll be the, for the first time, and for others it'll be a review. The auditory system is pretty great. It's, uh, it's more complex than the olfactory system. It's more complicated than smelling or tasting. It's not as complicated as vision. The eyes are the most complicated sensory organ that we have. Consequently, or because of, I should say, human beings evolved to be to process vision. We process vision much more readily than we process sound. I didn't say faster. <clears throat> it actually takes us longer to process what we see compared to what we hear. Our auditory system is a little bit cruder. But those of you who are working in digital audio workstations and you've got that screen in front of you all the time, be careful because you've got way more neurons devoted to processing what you see compared to what you hear. And vision is going to trump sound. In the old days, the days that I'm from, when we worked with analog, looking at the machine didn't tell us anything. We didn't need to look at the machine. There was nothing, no information there we could use. So we just listened, and that helps to make you an auditory athlete. So that was just a brief sidebar uh, suggesting that you be careful of your visual system because it's going to um, take over for the auditory system in some capacity. So anyway, the auditory system is basically an A to D converter. Variations in air pressure come into your ear canal move the eardrum back and forth. That moves the three bones, the little, little bones of the middle ear back and forth. And that little thing that looks like a stirrup, that little bone pushes on the oval window of the cochlea. So it, the, the membrane of the oval window is gonna vibrate back and forth the same way that the air pressure molecules did. And it's gonna push a membrane called the basilar membrane up and down. Um, Sound processing in the ear is arranged a little bit like, um, well, it's arranged tonotopically, like the keys on a piano. The high frequencies reach their maximum levels of, of amplitude and their maximum levels of excitation right there near the base, right where the, the little oval window is and the stapes, the little bone is. That's where your high frequencies mostly reach their maximum amplitude. Low frequencies reach their maximum amplitude all the way at the very end of the cochlea in the middle of that snail. So on top of the basilar membrane are two types of hair cells. There's a single row of inner hair cells, and there's a triple row of outer hair cells. The inner hair cells do 95% of the job of sending pressure variations 
uh, up the chain to the brain. So what happens? Those are your little A to D converters. So there's the little hair cell, and it's called a hair cell because it has, it looks like hairs, these cilia on the top of the body of the cell. So the basilar membrane is going up and down in response to sound pressure. The little hairs on the top of the hair cell are going back and forth. This is, the, this is just the wildest shit. <laughs> it really is. If I walk you through it, I think you'll see why. So the little hairs are at the top of the cell. The little hairs are connected by little tiny springs. And when those wee little hairs are going back and forth, the springs are expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting. But there's more. When the hairs go back and forth and the springs expand and contract, there's pores in the little hairs. <laughs> Like, who would design this? There's pores in the little hairs. The pores open and close with every cycle of that waving back and forth. Those pores opening and closing allow charged ions into and out of the hair cell. And there's your A to D conversion. Analog activity, meaning the basilar membrane going up and down, a mechanical force, becomes a one or a zero, a one or a zero. It becomes a nerve spike. At the bottom of the hair cell, you see those yellow lines, that's representing your wiring. That's the auditory nerve bundle. On each side, uh, left and right, we've got roughly, approximately 30,000 auditory nerves. It's called the auditory nerve bundle that goes from the inner hair cells and it goes and it comes right up here and it terminates right here at your auditory cortex above your ears. What happens in auditory neuropathy is that overexposure to noise can cause some of the wires to break. That's an oversimplification, but what's actually happening is the base of the little wire, let's call it a wire, but it's not, it's a nerve. The base of, of, of the nerve is right here, and on top of it is the hair cell. When the hair cells are releasing neurotransmitters into the synapse, the gap in between the, the nerve and the hair cell, the neurotransmitter that it releases is called an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's glutamate. It's excitatory. It tells this cell here, fire. Fire with an action potential. When you're listening to a 1K, 1,000 hertz pure tone, those little hair cells are going back and forth a thousand times a second. And the nerve spikes are just firing, firing, firing. And that's nothing. Like, 1K is nothing. That's mid-range to your hearing system. Anyway, it's firing, and the little nerve is like, got it, I got it, and it's receiving all this glutamate. When you're blasting that sound in your big monitors, and your entire auditory nerve bundle is having to catch all that glutamate, Sometimes the ends of the nerves can swell up like balloons from too much glutamate, and they pop. And that's called excitotoxicity. It means too much of an excitatory neurotransmitter can be toxic to the poor little nerve. Now, every auditory nerve, just like branches on a tree, is going to have smaller branches called dendritic spines that can handle some of that. But if you burst enough of those, eventually, just like on a tree, if you, if you poison some of the end branches and you keep doing it, it can cause the poison to kind of spread down the limb of the tree and eventually you're going to lose the limb of the tree. And then eventually you'll lose the entire tree. So what happens with our auditory nerve bundle is that if there's too much excitotoxicity, you begin to lose some of the wiring. And that can eventually, over time, over years, take down many more of the wires. So this, um, this graph is from uh, Christoph Plaque and, uh, and colleagues from 2014, but it's just a comparison of what processing is like when you've got 10 auditory nerve fibers, nice and healthy, let's say, over there on the left, compared to having only three. So suppose you're listening to an amplitude-modulated sine wave, 
like is shown in the picture. If you've got 10 auditory nerve fibers, you can encode that signal with those 10 fibers pretty well. If you look at the drawing on the left, or the graph on the left, you see that there are a lot of nerve activities, a lot of spikes, nerve spikes, corresponding to the peak of the amplitude variations. And then there are some spikes that correspond to the little peaks in the fine structure. The summed activity is showing that you're representing both the amplitude modulation, the envelope, and you're also representing the fine structure pretty well with those 10 fibers. But what happens if you only have three fibers to do the same encoding job? It's the equivalent of going from a high-resolution digital photograph down to a Polaroid. So if you've got a high-res picture, you can see, oh, that's our family photograph, and there's dad, and he's in the driveway, and there's the boat, and oh, yeah, you can, it's dad. And the zipper on his fly is down. <laughs> if you're looking at a Polaroid, all you can see is, well, there's the boat, and there's dad. But you can't see the details. So uh, you, I, I think most of you know better than I, because most of you are digital audio engineers, 4-bit resolution or 8-bit resolution is going to be a representation of the original sound. You'll be able to say what that original sound is, but you won't be able to hear the details the way you would with 24-bit resolution uh, because you've lost, in this case, in this analogy, some of your wiring. What ends up happening is that phenomenon becomes... when. The, the phenomenon we observe when uh, usually elderly people will do this, they'll say, stop shouting, I can't hear you. It's not that they can't hear. They can hear. They just can't resolve the signal that they're hearing. You don't need to yell louder. You just need to speak more articulately and more slowly. Everything to them sounds like mumbling because it's very low res. Oh, now there's a mouse. The mouse is from Sharon Kujawa and Charles Lieberman's lab. They published a paper in 2009 that uh, started a quiet revolution among audiologists. Uh, Charles Lieberman and Sharon Kujawa are at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. And they were looking at the origin of hearing disorders. They expected to find that that origin would be loss of hair cells, but it turned out that it wasn't loss of hair cells that was causing most of the problem. It was actually the loss of auditory nerves, the process that I just explained to you. So what they did uh, with these mice is they exposed them to two hours of noise. It was 100 dB SPL, and it was in that 8K to 16K band, which to us would correspond to 2.5K to 5K. So mice, gerbils, chinchillas, and cats all have fairly typical mammalian ears. A lot of psychoacoustics work is done with these animals because their hearing is similar to ours. It's just shifted up uh, many frequencies. So here's what Sharon Kujawa and Charles Lieberman found. Synaptic responses in the exposure band recovered after exposure, but the higher frequencies didn't. So I'll walk you through this, this graph. They're referring to, on the y-axis there, synaptic ribbons per inner hair cell. A synaptic ribbon is, if you look at it over there on the right, the synaptic ribbon refers to the little red structures, or they're colored red in that diagram. It's a docking station for neurotransmitters. It's called a ribbon because it just sits in there in the inner hair cell, and the little neurotransmitters just sit on it, waiting to become action potentials, nerve spikes. Those synaptic ribbons get lost when you have caused damage to the auditory nerve. So what they showed here, let's go back to that left graph. We're looking at cochlear frequency on the x-axis. The band that's in gray is the noise band that the mice were exposed to. Um, green is control. And then uh, after one day is in red, after three days and after eight weeks is in black. When the researchers just looked at the band of frequencies that the mice were exposed to, they saw no loss, no loss of synaptic ribbons in that band. But when they looked higher, they saw that the loss was actually higher than the band the mice had been exposed to. So if you're comparing that to humans, you might say that if humans were exposed 
to high intensity levels from 2.5K up to about 5K, we wouldn't necessarily experience loss in that frequency band. The loss is in the higher bands. We would start to lose our 8K and our 16K. And you can see that that happened as quickly as one day after exposure for these uh, poor little mice. So 50% of their synaptic ribbons were damaged after noise exposure. And that was, I should add, that was pretty extreme noise exposure for those mice because they usually live in a quiet environment. Loss of synaptic ribbons was then followed by a gradual loss of the corresponding auditory nerve fibers. This graph is just showing what it looks like. Control are the ones that didn't get any exposure to noise, and then the one on the right over there is one day post-exposure. The red spheres, circles, are inner hair cells, and you can see that even some of the inner hair cells start to die off a little bit when um, the synaptic ribbons are dying off. So synaptic ribbons, as I already told you, feed neurotransmitters to the synapses, to the auditory nerves, and that generates action potentials in the nerve. Glutamate excitotoxicity can swell and rupture those auditory nerve terminals and lead to cell degradation. So I told you we were going to do the bad news in the middle, and we're going to work our way. <laughs> if you're starting to think, oh, no, we'll work our way toward treatments. Uh, this is a healthy ear versus an exposed ear three days later. The region shown for these mice is 45K, which is higher than what the mice heard. You'll see a big difference between the left, which is the control, and the right side, which was three days post-exposure. These mice had already killed off some of those, those green tendrils, our auditory nerve fibers. They used an immunostaining techni technique to reveal synaptopathy meaning loss of synapses where the inner hair cell meets the auditory nerve, and the loss was greatest in the high-frequency region for those mice. Here's how that kind of loss can lead to tinnitus, as well as this hidden hearing loss. What this figure is showing us is the auditory path in humans from the cochlea going up through the brainstem to reach the cortex right here. And in the upper left there, it's showing a, a, a waveform called the auditory brainstem response. That's the data that I collect in my own laboratory at Berkeley. The auditory brainstem response is showing you the response of the auditory nerve bundle, of your wiring, in the first seven milliseconds after you receive a sound. What we want to see in a good, healthy ear is a nice peak one, a nice peak three and a nice peak five. Those peaks correspond to important stations in the auditory processing path. Peak one is the output of the cochlea, and that happens between one and two milliseconds after you hear a sound. So if your cochlea is firing and that auditory nerve bundle is working, you're going to have a nice peak one in your auditory brainstem response. Peak three corresponds to a middle station in the auditory path. Peak five corresponds to a structure called the inferior colliculus. It's the first smart structure in your auditory path. Uh, musicians usually show higher amplitudes in peak five, and it usually happens a little bit faster. And uh, I'm beginning to see from the data in my own laboratory that this applies to, this may apply to audio engineers as well. When you do a lot of focused concentration on sound, your brain sends signals down to the cochlea and pumps up the activity at the inferior colliculus. So you get a nice, fat, high peak at peak five. What this is showing, though, down there at the bottom is that it's, a, it's a, a, like a cartoon drawing of a healthy hair cell with red, blue, and green fibers connecting to it, auditory nerve fibers. And that would show you a decent-sized peak one, and it would also show you a decent-sized peak five. The figure that represents response gain is referring to your body. It's referring to your metabolism. Your hearing is a, is a, is a metabolic function. It, when you're tired, uh, when, when you're tired, I, I didn't sleep last night because I was on a red-eye flight, so I was about to describe exactly what that feels like. 
<laughs> so when you're tired, when you haven't eaten, when you've been in the studio just blasting your ears, you're out of metabolites. If you need to finish that mix, if you need to stay in that session or whatever, your body is going to, through sheer willpower, crank up the gain to help you devote more resources to hearing so that you can really hone in on, on what you're doing. Now, if you've killed off some of those auditory nerves, down at the bottom there, you'll see what the response would look like for wave one. The peak of wave one would be reduced because fewer nerves are available to send a good, strong signal up to the brain. When that peak is reduced, what your body does is it turns up the gain and it tries even harder to compensate for the loss of input at your cochlea. When that happens, wave five can be sort of clipped, and that can be, um, or that is, I should say, implicated in tinnitus. So if your input stage is kind of broken and you crank the gain, that tells you that when you're really exhausted, as soon as those hair cells start to vibrate, as soon as any little thing has a glitch in the system, with that high gain of your body's amplifier, you may perceive that as ringing, as tinnitus. So the auditory system compensates for diminished input by upregulating responsiveness later in the path. The proposed links between noise exposure and perceptual difficulties have been mapped out in this paper by Plack, Barker, and Prendergast. Too much noise exposure can lead to loss of auditory nerve fibers. That can then cause you to turn up the central gain in your hearing system to compensate for it. That can result with fewer wires, a deficit in temporal coding and a deficit in intensity coding. That can lead to poor interaural phase discrimination, poor frequency discrimi discrimination, poor intensity, loudness discrimination, which can then be manifest as tinnitus or hyperacusis. And other studies have shown uh, it can result in poor sound localization, that ability that audio engineers and record makers and DJs rely on so well your depth of field, your panning, all depends on your capacity to hear fine differences in delays and in, in reverb. It can lead to poor speech identification and poor pitch perception. So talking a little bit more about tinnitus, we see that uh, tinnitus affects approximately 10 to 20% of people, but a much higher percentage of musicians. Tinnitus may originate from auditory nerve damage. It has, uh, tinnitus has a couple of different origins. It can uh, be caused by some rewiring up here at the cortex. Some people have really healthy cochleas. Uh, but it's the cortex here, the, the higher region of the brain that did a little bit of rewiring and causes that tinnitus. But other times tinnitus has an origin that is lower down in, in the cochlea. Rats with and without tinnitus were compared. Differences in their inner hair cell health appeared in the high frequency regions of the cochlea. So if the auditory system fails to adapt to these degradations, tinnitus may result. So you would, might ask yourself, how in the hell do you know if a rat has tinnitus. <laughs> well, um, the tinnitus is going to be in a certain frequency band. So what they do is they train the rats to respond to a certain frequency. Let's say it's 3K. So when you hear that 3K tone, you're going to get a treat. So when he hears 3K, he goes over there and he goes looking for his treat. If he's got tinnitus, the tinnitus is going to mask that 3K tone. So rats without tinnitus are going to be able to hear it, and the rats with tinnitus will have it masked. There are clever methods for testing these things. Now, let's start getting to the good news. Auditory aging occurs independently of lifestyle. Your hearing system, just like your eyes, just like your skin, is going to age. Some studies have shown that there are actual benefits, as I started by saying, to being an auditory athlete, but there's more. There are benefits to really loving what you're doing. Some protective benefits. The mechanism of how this works has not been mapped out. These discoveries are brand new. 
But, just so you know, a normal audiogram like you would get at your doctor's office or at the audiologist's office can hide many abnormalities, including tinnitus and hyperacusis and the poor speech and noise discrimination. The reason why is because an audiogram tests something that isn't all that hard to do. An audiogram just feeds you a pure sine wave at a really low level, and you don't need many wires to process that. If you detect it, you detect it. So you can walk out of your audiologist's office and he tells you, your hearing's great. And you're saying to your audiologist, no, it isn't. <laughs> I know it used to be much better, but the normal range, according to an audiologist, is 30 dB. It can go from an extra 10 dB hotter than average all the way to 20 dB below where most people are, and it's still considered normal. And they typically only test up to about 8K or so. Those of us who work in music, uh, we need frequencies beyond 8K, as you very well know. This is from uh, Gerald Fleischer. He published this work in 2008, and it was pretty exciting. He tested thousands, literally thousands, of male participants in Europe and in China to just to measure, just to know what's their hearing like and how, does hear, how do we lose our hearing due to, due to age and are there correlations between lifestyles or professions and hearing loss. So let's look at the one on the left here first. The one on the left is showing 187 male orchestra musicians and then down below it it's showing 201 male construction workers. And one of the reasons that he used males only is because men and women hear slightly differently. It has to do with a number of factors. It has to do with the size of our heads, women have smaller heads, and it has to do with hormones, it has to do with the metabolism that processes sound, it's slightly different. So in order to be consistent, he went with just men. But as you can see, that blue line, the horizontal blue line, is average, normal hearing, and he saw that 83.4% of his orchestra musicians had better than average hearing and only about 16.6%, .6 the red line, had worse hearing. Compared to construction workers, his construction workers down there at the bottom left, uh, you can see that 53.7% of them had really bad hearing. He was curious about this, so he began testing people all over Europe and in China, two areas in China, one that was a very busy city and another that was a very remote area, to just measure their hearing. He looked at organ tuners. Organ tuners are exposed to really high SPL because to tune those pipes, they have to get their head right in there. And it's a, it's, a, it's a high noise job. He looked at police officers. He looked at sound designers, like many of you in this room. He looked at people who were congenitally blind. Firefighters, his orchestra musicians, airline pilots, military musicians, office personnel, quiet environments, people who don't go to discos, people who do go to discos, people who lived in China in the city, construction workers, and people who lived at the very bottom one there, 100. 27 people, I can't pronounce the name of this city, but it wasn't even a city, it was way out in the country. He saw the left side of, the, of that graph is showing better than normal hearing, and the right side is showing worse. The population that had the absolute worst hearing were the people who lived in this remote area of China, where there's no planes overhead, where it's really, really quiet, and upon investigation, it kind of made sense. It's like those fish that live at the bottom of the sea that never see light. They evolve to no longer have eyes. If you don't stimulate the organ, like your parents always told you, you know, don't read in the dark, you'll lose your, you'll go blind. It's because we need to stimulate the organ in order for the organ to work properly. Construction workers are different from orchestra musicians. Both populations are getting high SPLs on the job. The difference is the orchestra musician knows it's coming, and the orchestra musician is ostensibly enjoying himself or herself. You've got a score in front of you, and you know that in the next bar, the horns are gonna blast. And you're on stage, you're having a good time, you've got those endorphins going, whereas the construction worker, 
doesn't necessarily know it's coming. You walk past a, a truck and some guy drops a pallet off the back of the truck. It's that surprise, which is the insult to the injury that can cause more damage to your hearing than if you know it's coming. So, emotional exhaustion and long-term stress are predictors of hearing disorders, including tinnitus. Sound and also stress influence many of the same cortisol-responsive receptors in the brain. So think about that. Sound influences our fight or flight mechanism. That mechanism can get really attached to the thrill of cranking it. It feels good. I'm sure every one of us in this room has done it. It feels great, that stimulation. When you're controlling it, it doesn't feel as great if you're a construction worker or someone is blasting your ears in an environment that is causing you great stress. So high stress levels at the time of noise trauma is more damaging than moderate stress levels, which actually is followed by improved auditory nerve response, moderate stress levels. So when you're having to get that mix done or you're having to get something turned into your client, that can actually help your hearing. The age of audio trauma is important. Younger pre-puberty mice were shown to be more vulnerable than mature mice. That's important, too, for us as human beings to know that it's the teenagers who are, and kids who are going to be at greater risk. I've only got a few more slides, but, uh, and then we're going to turn it over to your questions. Um, these papers, the next two things I'm going to show you, just came out. There's a lot of grant money devoted to uh, hearing health research. This paper came out in September of this year, and it's showing, uh, it's talking about new treatments for tinnitus. Uh, they were showing that oxytocin nasal spray reduced tinnitus severity. Oxytocin is that feel-good, the love hormone, when it's in the right concentration in this nasal spray, <laughs> feel pretty good. <laughs> and it can reduce the reported uh, severity of tinnitus. So on the y-axis there is the, the tinnitus um, severity score, and then on the bottom it's weeks. So uh, up there, the far left is the baseline, the pre the pre-level of severity, and you see that it declined over 10 weeks using this oxytocin nasal spray. It's a brand new, these are just trials right now, but it's brand new research. Likewise, uh, some researchers, including folks at Massachusetts Eye and Ear, are doing a lot of work on regrowing hair cells. So um, I told you about the tip links, the springs that connect the little hairs. If you blast out that hair cell, you can break those little springs, and then the hair cell eventually dies. Um, a number of different methods are looking at how to regrow hair cells, pharmaceuticals, and then also uh, pluripotent stem cells, stem cells that can become any kind of cell, sometimes can be used, you, you put it in the Petri dish and you grow the new cell, and if it looks like, okay, well, I got a new cell here, I'm gonna put it in this mouse. So if you get it growing in the Petri dish that's in vitro, you can put it in the mouse, which is in vivo, and now they're working on, instead of putting it in the mouse, putting it in human beings. Brand new stuff, though, new research. So in summary, if you were interested, uh, this is the work that's been done just in the last five, six, seven years on tinnitus, hyperacusis, speech and noise perception, auditory attention. If you can process it better, you're more inclined to pay attention. Little kids who take music lessons are better listeners in class. They listen to their teacher better because they can process audio signals uh, more rapidly. Pitch perception, spatial localization, and even emotion perception, picking up on the subtle nuances in music, all depends upon a healthy auditory processing system. So, um, last slide. If you want to have a long career, protect your hearing. I did a Google search. I just put in best earplugs for musicians. All kinds of stuff comes up, from inexpensive to the custom-made ones. Uh, at Berkeley, we are just now initiating a hearing health initiative. We're going to try to make, at Berkeley College of Music, we're going to try to make hearing health awareness be you 
ubiquitous on our campus. So you go into the rehearsal rooms now at Berkeley and you see those hand sanitizers by the door. A lot of places have them, you know, offices and things, a hand sanitizer. You want to kill germs. Uh, at Berkeley, we are talking about having those uh, foam earplug dispensers by the door when you go in to the rehearsal room or the ensemble room, the practice room. Just have them. Just have them. Think about sun exposure. Think about overstimulating the organ. Think about protecting it. Now, the foam earplugs, they're not good for sound designers. They're not good for uh, astute work. But if you're practicing with your heavy metal band, it would behoove you to have something in, anything in there. Think about those poor little hair cells and don't beat them up too badly because you're going to want to use them your whole career. So that's all I've got for you. Thank you for your attention. So, you? Oh. so now I have to apologize. It's over here, Susan. Oh, there you are. <laughs> we received an, an email this morning that the German-based expert for Tiny Toast Foundation um, um, cost by sick, uh, you won't make it. Oh. So, uh, but that puts us in a situation to raise questions. Um, so we have two microphones on the left and right side. So uh, the audience ask to raise right. questions to Susan. Please use it. And thank you very much for the enlightening thank you. talk. Hi. Um, what exactly are the limits of the hearing for a female? That you said uh, yeah, our brains are more smaller and of course our brains are different. But I want to know the range, the frequency range, that, that's the difference. The frequency range is the same. It, um, when, they, when researchers tell us that men and women hear differently, it, it doesn't refer to the range necessarily, it refers to our sensitivity. Uh, we know that auditory brainstem response for women can be a fraction of a millisecond faster than for men, primarily due to the, it's just, it's a smaller path because we have smaller heads. Uh, so it's a little bit faster, but uh, there is anecdotal evidence and there's a little bit of evidence that hasn't yet been supported that women are more sensitive than men to low frequencies and men are more sensitive to high frequencies. Sensitive in that uh, they, um, they favor it. Uh, it is known that men and women process colors differently too in our, in our visual system. And women have slightly more, I don't remember if it's rods or cones, but we've got more receptors available for processing uh, vision. Uh, we don't necessarily have more receptors available for processing sound, but we tend to be a little bit more sensitive in different areas. Um, it, we, need, we need more data to map that out completely, but that's the early suggestion anyway. Thank you. Hmm. Other questions? Yeah, over here, just a second. Hi, Susan. Hi, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank um, you. I had a quick question. You touched a little bit on uh, the different kind of ringing that can happen mm -hmm. um, directly after exposure to high uh, sound pressure level um, versus the tinnitus that happens at a right. later time. Um, can you touch on what that oh, is? Oh, I'm glad you asked me about that. Yeah, that's called temporary threshold shift. So when you go to a club and uh, you really give your ears a pounding for a few hours, when you come out of that club, your threshold of hearing has been raised, meaning your hearing has gotten worse. Um, it's, it begins right away to recover. So temporary, thre temporary threshold shift lasts for 24 hours, but most of the recovery happens in the first two or three hours. By five, between five and eight hours, a good deal of the recovery has happened, and by the next day, you're back to normal. That's temporary threshold shift. But what Kujawa and Lieberman were showing in their laboratory is that after you expose these mice to noise and then you test their hearing, a day later, it looks like their hearing is fine. But if you test them higher, in a higher frequency band, higher than what they were exposed to, that's the band that didn't actually recover. And that was the finding that made uh, auditory researchers around the world go, oh, holy shit, uh, now we kind of, this kind of explains a lot. Yeah, so do protect your ears when you're going to those clubs. Do protect them. And do remember, too, um, when it feels good, 
to be listening to sound loud. You are offering yourself, I hesitate to say this, but the data seems to support it, a little bit of protection. Just don't do that too much for too long. Be careful. Yes. Other questions? Yes. Um, here, over here. Oh. <laughs> uh, just, if I understood you correctly, um, this whole stress and, and hearing loss is connected and it's more damageable to your ears to work with sound under pressure? Yes, yes. Is that something that's permanent or does it only affect your hearing temporarily so that you will, for instance, deliver a poorer mix while under heavy stress? Mm. Now the data, the data is saying, that's, that's a, it's a good question, the data is saying that the damage or the risk of damage is worse if you are stimul overly stimulating the organ in a stressful situation compared to stimulating the organ the exact same way mechanically, but in a really happy situation. So any of us who've worked in the music business for any length of time know the difference. Uh, there, it's a stressful business, especially if you're competing at the highest level. There's a lot of money on the line, the stakes are high, your reputation is on the line. We make a living in the arts, and that's no day at the beach. It's hard. It's always going to be stressful. Moderately, moderate stress is actually good for you. It gives you that little bit of adrenaline that makes you do better work and actually helps protect your hearing system. But that hardcore stress, when things are going really poorly and you can't get out of it, that's the dangerous situation. So when you know you're really, really stressed, just turn it down. Turn it down, and, and you'll do less damage. Now, you had asked about, um, does it make you do worse mixing? That I don't know. That I don't know. Uh, and uh, there's a new, uh, there's some researchers at the Max Planck Institute who are interested in neuroaesthetics and, and elsewhere. A lot of researchers now, uh, the new hot topic in music cognition research is neuroaesthetics, meaning what is the neural signal that corresponds to something that's good. So we all know, this is what we do all the time, we're always judging sound. You're always tweaking a sound and you're going, not that, not that, not that, not that, that. That's what I'm talking about. Now that's right. So something happens in your body and in your nervous system when it's right. We don't know yet what that something is. But when that can be mapped to actual biological processes, it'll no doubt be linked to the processes that confer hearing advantages or, or protection as well. Sometimes, some of us, we do, our, we do good work when we're stressed, but if you're overly stressed, I, I don't know, probably unlikely. Well, thanks for your question. <laughs> yes? Hi. So I also suffer from, as well as tinnitus, from mutation mm -hmm. tube dysfunction. Is there any sort of link so you can tell me any more? Oh, I'm say, say the second part again. Um, mutation tube dysfunction. Oh, that I'm afraid I haven't studied, so I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, is it like a blockage or a... Uh, it feels like it's blocked. It yeah. just doesn't... Uh, it's supposed to be inflated and I can't do inflated uh, to regulate the balance as well, regulate I, the pressure. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know. I, have, I haven't read about it, so I'm afraid I, I couldn't say anything about it. The eustachian tubes are those tubes that are all part of your cochlear vestibular system, which is responsible for balance and responsible for pressure. When you have a head cold and you fly in an airplane, those eustachian tubes get blocked and it's really, really painful. Those are the vents that release the pressure in our system. The auditory system is under a lot of pressure because it has to convert uh, molecule movement in air, air pressure waves, into a liquid environment. Inside the cochlea is liquid. The, the liquid that's in the cochlea is this hyper-dense fluid called perilymph. In the middle part of it is a fluid called indolymph, and it's full of uh, all kinds of ions. It's so dense that you, if you were lying in it, you wouldn't sink. You couldn't possibly drown because you wouldn't sink in it. But anyway, you've got to take these air pressure variations and convert that to liquid pressure variations. That's what the bones in the middle ear do. So pressure builds up and the eustachian tubes release that pressure. So if there's a blockage, I can imagine that would be painful. How that affects hearing, I don't know though. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. 
I have a question. So uh, basically we have eardrum, which can stretch a little bit, like can be harder, software, some, softer, some, something like that. I mean, what about momentary loudness? For example, if we have long-term oh. loudness, when our eardrum is hard, then unexpected momentary yeah. loudness. How, how about that problem? There's, um, there's a reflex that you may know of called the acoustic reflex. The acoustic reflex, it was thought, kicks in to protect our ears from damage. What the acoustic reflex is, is a contraction of the ligaments that control the bones of the middle ear. So if uh, that drummer just whacks that snare drum right behind you and you weren't looking, the um, ligaments in the middle ear are gonna cause the bones to like clamp, just like bending your knees and your ankles so that it doesn't cause too much vibration. It's like a shock absorber. The problem with the acoustic reflex and the theory of protection is that it doesn't work like that. The acoustic reflex takes between 200 and 250 milliseconds to kick in, which won't give you any protection from a snare drum hit, a cymbal hit, a gunshot. It's just not fast enough. So I think I heard from one of my colleagues recently that some, there's a new paper on the acoustic reflex and why that actually might have evolved. It makes more sense that it would have evolved to protect us over the long term rather than protect us over the short term. We do know that when Let's say you've done a mix. You leave the room, you rest your ears for 10, 15 minutes. You come back in to the room and you hit play on the tape machine. <laughs> you hit play on your recording device. In the first minute, your hearing system is refreshed. And in the first minute, you're hearing what's actually there barring any hearing damage that you may have. After that minute, your auditory system says, I don't like this anymore. And it kind of, uh, in, it kind of uh, kicks in a little bit of a protective mechanism to kind of damp things a little bit so that you won't overly stimulate that organ. You've really only got that first minute to really hear it accurately, especially if you're listening loud. Your auditory system is going to want to try to protect you. That's uh, partly it does that because um, the hair cells are going back and forth. They run out of little ions and they, they keep mechanically going back and forth, but they can't generate an action potential every time. They've got to stop and get more ions from elsewhere in the body so that they can resume with the signaling. Thanks. It's a fascinating system, learning about the auditory system. I wish I had known about it when I was making records. Just, it would have been nice to have been able to picture it. And I would have protected my hearing better. Other questions? Hi. Oh, hi. Um, so you mentioned that going to get a typical hearing test is not terribly useful, right, when they're playing these sign tones at different levels and you raise your hand. Yeah. Um, so what can you do to get a, a useful hearing test, and is there any point, <laughs> let's oh, say? I mean, if, if, yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. I'm really glad. So now audiologists, in the recent papers that I've read, have said just a pure audiogram is not nearly enough. We have to do the auditory brainstem response. The ABR that I was showing you, the, the wave earlier with peak one, peak three, and peak five. The ABR, you can ask your audiologist for one. It's really easy to do. You just stick the electrode. You put one electrode right here on the forehead, and then the other two electrodes, I don't want to mess up the microphone, but you stick it on the mastoid bones, the bone that's right behind your ear. So you stick these things that are like piezo pickups. You just stick them on the bones behind your ear, and then one here to be like the ground wire, and you put in these really fancy, expensive earbuds, and you're usually fed a click train, just a series of tick, 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 tick. It needs to be the most boring sound in the world so that your brain won't pay any attention to it. So we're just looking at the signal coming out of the cochlea. So if you ask for an ABR, it'll show you the health of peak one, three, and five, and your audiologist can explain it to you. There are two other tests they can do. They can look at the autoacoustic emissions. Autoacoustic emissions is the sound that comes out of your ear. It was another mind-blowing fact. All of our ears, well, a healthy ear anyway, is going to have sound that comes out of it. It's below the threshold of hearing, so we can't hear it. But if you put in a little microphone in your ear canal, you could hear it if you amplified it. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, 
but an, uh, an autoacoustic emission is a sign of healthy outer hair cells. Outer hair cells we didn't talk about, but they're very, very important for, those are your little amplifiers and those are the little things that help you hone in on certain signals in, in, in a mix, for example. Uh, they, can, they can do a, autoacoustic emissions test and look at your outer hair cells as well. So there's a battery of tests that they can do now that will give you a full complement of, uh, and really let you know what your, your auditory system is doing. I have a question here. Um, mm. You mentioned about treatments for tinnitus and um, the, you mentioned the nasal spray for yeah. the oxytocin, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if, if the, there's access to those treatments or how we can, we can, we, we can get a, a spray, for example. Yeah, so this, this treatment, this paper was just released in September, so it'll be a little while before it's out there on the market, but w because governments know that people are suffering with this, and governments also know that we quickly, quickly need a better treatment than what we've had in the past, I imagine that these things will be rushed along. Uh, I don't know if you know, if you ever use this, but the best search engine is Google Scholar, for scholarly papers and research. So you can just go into Google Scholar and you can put in the search terms tinnitus or hyperacusis and you'll see all the most recent peer-reviewed papers will pop up. Prior to this nasal spray, the really, this is sad, the only real treatment for it is they just basically tell you, just try to ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> really, that's, that's basically what they say, just try to ignore it. So. Uh, there's a therapy that works a little bit, and it's a noise therapy. And what that is, is let's say that your ringing frequency, your tinnitus frequency is 3K. When a brain realizes that a sound is really important in its environment, it grows more neurons in the cortex in order to process that better. So anything you do a lot, you get good at, so be careful what you do a lot. So if you're hearing 3K in your head all the time, there are going to be a lot of neurons right here in the cortex that process 3K. So what these brilliant researchers discovered is when you feed people for 30 minutes a day, for a couple of weeks, 30 minutes a day, a couple of weeks, 2.9K, do that every day. Just, oh, I mean, it sounds like hell to me, but it's a pure tone frequency, just doesn't have to be loud, 2.9K, and what the cortex says is, huh, this signal must be really important to this guy because he's listening to it every day. <laughs> and the neurons here in the cortex that were receiving 3K scoot over to help you process that thing that it thinks that you now love, which is 2.9K. And that pulls neural resources away from 3K. It's something it reduces it by a little bit. It, it's basically telling your brain, don't listen to that, listen to this. And that's distracting. So we need better treatments. Thanks. You're welcome. And besides the, the sign, like slightly down, there is another sound that someone told me that listen to C sound or a little white noise. Yeah. It's the same that you like, uh, I don't know the word, but you confuse your brain with yes. another thing. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah. It, it's, uh, other treatments include that noise therapy, which is broadband noise. And it's kind of training your brain, don't listen to that one frequency, here's what you want. And that has a way of equalizing all of the responsiveness in your cortex so that you're not focusing just on that 3K, you're focusing on all the frequencies because you're giving yourself broadband noise. It's a way of harnessing the brain's plasticity and getting those neurons, the receptors, to just kind of scoot over and ignore that one spot. We, the tinnitus researchers, they agree. They say, this is the best we've got right now and it's not very good but we're going to keep working on it to see what we can get. Because so many people, especially musicians, suffer from it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sorry we're running out of time. Thank you very much again for your enlightening talk. Uh, give it up for Susan Rogers. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.